I've entitled the message for tonight, Dying in Faith. The first three words of this verse, these all died. We're all headed toward death. Young people, old people, we're all headed toward death. That's not a morose way of thinking, it's just so. Our life is compared to a vapor. When you're out in the cold and you breathe, the vapor appears and it disappears. These earthly lives are compared in Scripture to a vapor. James says, what is your life? Even a vapor that appears for a little while. A little while. Or well, time's flying. And the older you get, the more you see that. Time's flying. Headed toward death. What is death? People look at, at it as the end of the process of life, the circle of life. You're born, you live, you die. It's all a part of life. People's funerals now are called celebrations of life. Don't call my funeral that. The moment you and I die is the beginning of conscious, eternal existence. Think about that. Conscious, eternal existence, either in heaven or in in hell. I love what the Lord said to that man, if you will enter into life. This is not life. It's really not. Somebody says, well, you're eating and drinking and breathing and doing. Well, it, this is still not life. Life begins upon death. Eternal conscious existence in heaven or in hell. Now I can see the attraction to atheism to a natural man. You know why? There's no eternal punishment. I can see the attraction to that. I can see the attraction to universalism, the fact that everybody's going to, not the fact, but the uh, error that everybody's going to wind up being saved. There's a Appeal to that, because if that's the case, no one will be in hell. But deep within the recesses of our conscience, we know God is. I'm saying this to you. I'm saying this to all men. We know that God is. We know that He made the world, He created the universe. Nobody made him, and he will reward the righteous, and he will punish the wicked. Nobody is going to get by with a thing. That is God. And deep down, we all know that is so, even if we deny it. We know it's so. Why is there death? These all died. Why is there death? Well, Paul answers that question for us in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, when he says, For by one man sin entered the world. Now, I want you to think of that statement. By this one man, 
by this one action, this one action of disobedience to God, sin entered the world. And death by sin, that's why there's death. So the death passed upon all men in that all sin. Now listen to that scripture. It didn't say merely that Adam's sin was charged to their account. It says when Adam sinned, I sinned. When Adam sinned, you sinned. Now I realize that there are people who will dislike the implications behind that. How can I be charged with a sin that was committed when I wasn't even born? I've got problems with that. Well, I guess I can understand that, but uh, were you born when Christ perfectly kept the law? Can you say, I don't want to have anything to do with his perfect obedience? Same principle. By one man, sin entered the world and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men in that all have sinned. When Adam sinned, you and I sinned. And I think this is so interesting. Before Adam sinned. Now get this. Before Adam sinned, God said to him, in the day you eat thereof. He didn't say if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Death was pronounced before there was death. Adam ate of the fruit. He died he became spiritually dead. He didn't die physically that day. You know that. As a matter of fact, he didn't die for 900 some years after that. But he became spiritually dead. And you and I are born into this world with a spiritually dead, sinful nature. Sin comes natural. Sin is as natural as breathing. You don't have to teach your children sin. It comes natural natural. You don't have to teach your children to lie. It comes natural. You don't need to teach your children to be selfish. That's the way we're born into this world. These all died. Had Adam never sinned, he would have never experienced death, but he sinned. And this death is so final. It's appointed to men wants to die. The time of your death has already been appointed. Nothing you can do to change that date. It's appointed to men wants to die and after that the judgment. Standing before God in judgment. Now this passage of scripture doesn't merely say these all died but it says these all died in faith. Well, that's the way I want to die. These all died in faith. Now, he's talking about Abel. He's talking about Noah. He's talking about everyone he's mentioned in this passage of Scripture. He's talking about Enoch. He's talking about Abraham. He's talking about Sarah. And he's talking about every single child of God. This is going to be said of every single child of God. These all died in faith. They persevered all the way to the end in faith. And upon their last breath, even if they didn't have a consciousness, even if it was hospice was called in and they didn't know who they were for the last two weeks or two months or whatever of their life, if they're a believer, these all died in faith. Now, there are two ways to die. The Lord said, if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. Dying in your sins 
being raised again in your sins. If I die in my sins, I will hear those awful words to me. Depart. This is Christ speaking. Depart, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. To that one who does not die in faith. If I die in faith. Oh, if I die in faith. I'll hear these words. Come, ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, there's only two ways to die. To die in your sins or to die in faith. And oh, if I die in faith, I will spend eternity my conscious existence of eternity will be in perfect conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ, beholding his face and worshiping him. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be when in rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me? This will be the epitaph of every believer. These all died in faith. They lived in faith. They persevered in faith. And they died in faith. Verse 13. These all died in faith. Speaking of all of God's elect. This refers to every believer. If I'm a believer, this is the way I'm going to die. I'm going to die in faith. Die believing the gospel. Die looking to Christ only. I, when I take my last breath, if I have consciousness, I will be trusting only Him. Believing in His absolute sufficiency to save me. These all died in faith. If I don't have consciousness, that will still be true with regard to me. Uh, these all died in faith. But look what it says next. This is an interesting statement. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Now what does that mean? Does that mean they heard the promises of God and they rejected them? Of course not. You know it doesn't mean that. If that were the case, they would not have died in faith. The whole time, here's what this means. The whole time they walked here upon this earth, they never experienced the promises in their bodies. They believed them. Now let's consider the word, the promises. The promises of God, exceeding, Peter said, exceeding great and precious promises. The promises of God. Salvation is all because of the promise of God. Now listen carefully. If you and I are saved, if we die in faith, here's why. God promised we would. God's promises cannot be without effect. If God made a promise with regard to this sinner, Todd Nobert, he's going to die in the faith. Guess what? I'm going to die in the faith. We read in 2 Timothy 1.1 of the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Verse 18. For if the inheritance, heavenly glory, likeness to Christ, eternity in heaven, 
is of the law. If it's given to me because of some act of obedience on my part, it's no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Look in verse 26 of the same chapter. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. All fleshly distinctions will be done away with. Aren't you looking forward to that time? No fleshly distinctions. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the what? The promise. The promise of God. Salvation is either by works, what I do, or what I promise to do. Oh, Lord, if you save me, I promise I'll never do that again. Right. Right. Or the eternal, sovereign promise of God. The promise of salvation, the hope of salvation is that when I die, I will stand before God as one who has never sinned. Now, think about that. If I die in the faith, according to the promise of God, when I stand before God in judgment and God looks at me, I will be one who has never committed a sin. One who has kept God's law perfectly. One who has loved God with all my heart. And I've loved my neighbor as myself. There will not be anything negative about me to be brought up on judgment day. It's all perfect. He's perfect. He never sinned. He's pleasing to me. God will look at me and listen to me. God doesn't pretend. He doesn't treat me as if this were the case. I will be accepted by him as one who has never sinned one who is perfectly obedient that is the promise of the gospel it's what's called in the bible justification you remember that poor publican in the temple beating upon his breast crying god be merciful to me the sinner that's how he saw himself and if you see yourself as you are that's how you'll see yourself the Sinner, definite article, the sinner. And you know what the Lord said with regard to that man and every other man who sees themselves in that light and prays the same prayer this man prayed? I tell you, that man went down to his house justified, cleared of all guilt, nothing to be guilty about. Justification doesn't mean you're forgiven. You are forgiven, but the reason you're forgiven is there's nothing to forgive you for. You're justified. Your sins are blotted out. You stand before God perfect. Now, what a hope. What a hope according to the promise of God. What a hope when God sees me. He sees someone who has never sinned. 1 John 4, 17 says, as he is, does he have any sin? As he is, did he ever sin? No. As he is, so are we in this world. Now that is the hope of the gospel according to the promise of God. If I stand before God like that, it's because he promised I would. When God told Abraham of the multitude of his descendants, at the time, Abraham didn't see any of them. As a matter of fact, uh, he didn't see anything but his old, worn-out body. But you know what? He believed God. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, 
giving glory to God. Being fully persuaded. God persuaded him. That's why he was fully persuaded. Being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Now that's how the believer feels about God's promises. What he promised, standing before him justified, having everything working together for my good and his glory. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. What he promised, he was able also to perform. Now when God's word tells me I'm justified before him, Without sin, sinless, perfect, I do not experience that in this life. I have the same experience that Paul had in this present life. There is no time. There is no time when I'm not made to say my sin is ever before me. I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. To will is present with me. I would never sin again. By the grace of God, I mean that. I would never sin again. To will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, as far as the performance of that desire, what did Paul say? I find not. I have not experienced the promises of God in this body of mine. Nor have you. And that will be true of me until my last breath. That's just the facts. I die in faith having never experienced sinlessness. Now that's go back to our text in Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises in their own body, in the, in the experience of sinlessness. But, that's a great word in the scripture, but, but God, but God, but having seen them afar off. When Abel offered up that lamb, he saw the promises afar off. He didn't believe the blood of that lamb. That lamb could take away his sin and make him perfect. But he saw what that lamb pointed to that would come some 4,000 years later, the lamb of God. Enoch, when it was said that he pleased God, he didn't look at himself and say, yeah, I do please God. Look how good I am. No, he knew that without faith, it was impossible to please God. Noah, when he built that ark, he spent 120 years building that ark. I love to think about that. 120 years. He saw the promise of God afar off. He saw salvation was in that ark, and that ark pointed to the coming one whom that ark represents, the Lord Jesus Christ, and being found in Abraham, oh, he saw the promise afar off. When he offered up Isaac and the substitute ram was provided for him and the scripture says he went, he went down the mountain rejoicing, he saw the promise afar, promise afar off. He saw how the Lord provided himself a lamb for a burnt offering. These men had the same faith you and I do. They saw it afar off. They were looking forward to it. We're looking back. But it was the same faith because it's the same object of faith. 
It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Sarah the same. She saw these promises afar off. She saw the uh, Christ coming through her seed. They saw the promises afar off. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says all the promises of God in Him are yea and amen. That means they're not conditioned upon you doing something to make them work. That's what Sarah tried, if you'll remember there in Genesis chapter 16. They're all yea, they're all sure, they're all certain, they're all amen, so be it. This is what I love. They saw the promises afar off. But look what it says next. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. Now, the word persuaded in the original is in the passive tense. That means somebody persuaded them. And I know who persuaded them. The same one who persuaded Paul when he says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Same one that's persuaded me. The reason I believe is because he persuaded me to believe. You know, preaching among whatever else it is, it's persuading people to believe. It's not just delivering a lecture. I want you to believe the gospel. I want you to be persuaded to trust the entire salvation of your soul upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm, but he's commanding you. I'm not giving you any commands, but he's commanding you to believe on his son. Don't wait for anything. Don't wait for an experience. Don't wait to get better. Believe on Christ right now just as you are. I've been persuaded. That's why I'm persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God persuaded me. And I am persuaded. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them. If God persuades you, you'll be persuaded. If you're not persuaded, it's because he hadn't persuaded you. When he persuades you, you're persuaded. You know this is the gospel. You know this is your only hope. But look what he says next. Not only were they persuaded of them, the scripture says they embraced them. They embraced them with hugs and kisses. They embrace these promises as absolute good news, the best thing they ever heard. They embraced them. They loved them. They welcomed them. They came to them as good news. They embraced them. You know, when it says... Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that means he was slain for sin before the foundation of the world. That means my sin was paid for before the foundation of the world in the person of my Lord Jesus Christ. You know what I do? I embrace that. I embrace it with hugs and kisses. I love it that way. I welcome this as the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I hear that he chose me in him before the foundation of the world, that I should be holy and without blame before him, you know what I do? I embrace that. Good news. When I hear that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all together come come out of the way. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. You know what I do? I embrace that. You say, what is there to embrace about that? Well, it teaches me to not look to myself for anything in my salvation, to wholly look outside of myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. I embrace that. 
I embrace it. I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad. I wouldn't want it any other way. When I hear that we're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, I embrace that. Good news. When I hear He by Himself purged our sins with no help, no contribution for me and you, I embrace that. I love that. Tell me more. This is what I want to hear. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I hear that in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and I'm complete in Him, I embrace that. When I hear by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I embrace that. That's good news to me. When I hear that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, I embrace that. That's the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. When I hear to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, I embrace that. The promises of God, and this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. We embrace, we welcome, we receive as good news the promises of God. Now lastly, these all died, but they all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed. Now this is a very important word. They confessed. And there's something public about confession. You can't be a private Christian. There's something public about confession. If I won't confess, I don't really believe. With the mouth, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And if I can't even confess with my mouth what I want to, I'm going to identify with those who do. I want to show whose side I'm on. You know, this is a true story there, that uh, uh, in the Revolutionary War, when the men were going out uh, to battle against the British, there was a little old woman that went out with a broomstick. And they said, you can't do anything with that broomstick. She goes, I know, but I'm going to show whose side I'm on. And that's what every believer does when he confesses Christ. I'm on his side. Confess. It's public. You're confessing, you believe. It's, it's, it, the word means agreement. We believe the same thing. Every believer believes the exact same thing. There's not believers that believe different things. Believers all believe the same. And you're, you say, well, you can't, well, what about all these denominations? You can't support any of that from Scripture. I mean, according to the Scripture, every believer believes the same thing. They all, without exception, believe that Christ is all in salvation. And they believe He's all to be preached, and they don't want to hear anything else. Every believer is at perfect agreement. That's what confession is. You confess the same thing. When you confess, you plead guilty. I plead guilty to believing that. After the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which were written in the law and in the prophets. Now, there's a very interesting verse of Scripture. It's found several times in the beginnings of the gospel. But when John the Baptist was preaching, it says regarding the multitudes that heard him, he said they, he baptized them confessing their sins. Now think about that phrase. It's several times in the scripture. He baptized them confessing their sins. They came and confessed their sins and were baptized of him. Now, does that mean that before they entered the waters of baptism, 
they made a public confession to everybody of their personal sins. I'm coming clean. Are you now? That's not what that means. It doesn't mean before they could be baptized, they first had to confess their sins publicly to John the Baptist or anybody else. Let me give you some good advice. Don't confess your sins to anybody but the Lord. It's nobody else's business. Confess them to the Lord. Uh, take sides with God against yourself with regard to your sin. Confess your sin to the Lord. Ask for deliverance from your sin to the Lord. Not some man. Well, here's what they were saying. When they confessed their sins, they were saying, this is their confession of sin, and this is their confession of the gospel. I am so sinful that the only way that I can be saved is by the perfect life, the sin-atoning death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ my only hope is that I am in him. When he lived, the only righteousness I have is his righteousness. When he died, the only sin payment I have is his bloody death on the cross. When he was raised from the dead, I was raised in him. I am so sinful. And I'm not talking about trying to... Uh, wallow before men about, oh, I'm so sinful. I'm not, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about in my heart. I know that I'm so sinful that the only way I can be saved is if I am in Jesus Christ the Lord. And he did everything for me. That's the believer's confession of Christ. And that's why baptism more than anything else, is the believer's public confession of Christ. I'd like to be like Peter when Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Regard him as holy. Regard him for who he is. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready, be always ready to give an answer to every man that asks you. Wouldn't you like to be around somebody and they see the way you deal with trials and they see your non-judgmental, merciful, gracious attitude toward them, toward all men. And they say, I'd like to know a reason for the hope that's in you. You know what I'd say? My hope is that Jesus Christ lived and died and was raised for me. This is all my hope and all my salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that we might be just like these saints of old, that we might die in the faith, not having received the promises, but seeing them. And being persuaded of them. And embracing them. And confessing that through your promises that's made this earth not our home. We're strangers and pilgrims waiting for that day that you call us into your presence. And we'll be with you eternally. Bless this word for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen.